the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Now over the years, I've been reminded in some interesting ways that our sons were paying attention when I spoke to them, just as my siblings and I were paying attention when our parents spoke to us. They were reminders to me that our words and our actions helped shape the persons they became. It was Christmas Eve a number of years ago. Our custom at the time was to head around the corner to Zach and Amanda's after Christmas Eve service and join with Amanda's family in a holiday celebration. While we were there, we would exchange our gifts with Zach and Amanda. Now, Amanda is an incredibly talented artist, and sometimes a gift from Zach and Amanda would be something featuring Amanda's artwork. And that was the case for me in this particular year. My gift that year was a t-shirt, this t-shirt, featuring her artwork. Artwork illustrating something I apparently said more than I realized. Use your head for something besides a hat rack. <laughs> now believe me, on many more than one occasion, my dad directed that same expression to me. But as I said, it wasn't just me. Our custom on Christmas Day was to go to my younger sister's house for dinner. Now, I'm not sure if it was the same year as I got the T-shirt or another Christmas, when we're sitting around the table and one of, one of my nieces mispronounced a word. I looked over at her and I began to say, you put your, and she finished the sentence for me, emphasis on the wrong syllable, <laughs> which was my dad's way of telling us we put our emphasis on the wrong syllable. So apparently my sister Mary repeated that particular expression a few times as well. Now I wouldn't classify either of those incidents as embarrassing. But there was that time in the summer of 1994. Nate was two when Debbie and I first moved to Orangeburg in 1984. Relax, I've got the ages right. <laughs> and Debbie was working a few hours a day at a sandwich shop two blocks from our house. While Debbie was at work, Nate was at a daycare in a church two blocks the other way from our house. One of the owners of the daycare was Sue. Sue and her husband, Bob, had a son Nate's age, and they became friends, so naturally, we became friends. Zach was born around the same time as Sue and Bob had their daughter, Jessie, so we became a neat little group, the eight of us. As life has it, Sue and Bob relocate from Orangeburg to Rome, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. A couple years later, Debbie is pregnant with Chris, and Sue and the kids come back to visit Sue's parents in Orangeburg. While they were there, Sue stops by the house one day with a gift for the baby. Debbie unwraps a gift, and inside is this, uh, not this one necessarily, but an Atlanta Braves onesie. <laughs> now you know where this is going, right? Then eight-year-old Zach is sitting at the table with us while all this is taking place. Now, Zach was then, and still is now, somewhat outspoken. I have no idea where he gets it from. <laughs> Zach sees this Atlanta Braves onesie, and he says, Dad, you're not going to let our baby wear that Atlanta Braves onesie, are you? <laughs> now, these incidents were all reminders for me of the impact we can have on our children. So last week we heard that Jesus had been teaching from a boat. At the end of the day, he told the disciples to take him to the other side of the sea. And while Jesus was sleeping, a storm comes along and the panicking disciples wake him. And Jesus calms the storm and the boat continues to the other side, the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee. 
When Jesus and the disciples get, on, get to the other side, the land of the Gerasenes, they are immediately, Mark's favorite word, greeted by the man with the unclean spirit named Legion. The man, or at least the spirit anyway, knew who Jesus was and begged Jesus to send he and the rest of his spirits that were inhabiting this man into the herd of pigs. So Jesus sent the spirit into the herd of pigs and 2,000 pigs went over the cliff. The people tending the pigs ran into the town to tell the folk, town folk what happened and they all came out and begged Jesus to leave. They didn't want him in their neighborhood. As Jesus was leaving, the man who he had removed the spirit from asked if he could go with Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus said, no, stay here and spread the word about what happened amongst your friends and neighbors. So in the Gospel of Mark, one of the very first evangelist was a Gentile, was another. So our text this morning starts with Jesus getting back to where last week's trip began, to the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee. When he gets there, a great crowd is waiting for him. And out of this crowd appears a synagogue leader named Jairus. There's Jairus in some TV show's impression of him. Jairus throws himself at Jesus' feet and begs him repeatedly to come with him and heal his daughter. Now, the text doesn't tell us how long Jesus was actually in the land of the Gerasenes on the other side of the sea, how long the trip across took for them to get back, whether or not they got any sleep, whether or not they had anything to eat, or any of that. All the text tells us that when Jairus throws himself at Jesus' feet, Jesus, and apparently the disciples, go with him. And as they're making their way, Jesus surrounded by this crowd of people, and they're pressing in on him. And now we have another example of one of Mark's favorite literary techniques, something called an intercalation. That's your vocabulary word for today. Mark likes to start a story, drop another story in the middle, and then come back and finish the first story. And sometimes the story in the middle just has nothing to do with the story it interrupts. But today it really adds to the drama of what's going on. So one of the people in this huge crowd is this woman suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She heard about Jesus and believed all she needed to do was touch his clothes to be made well. So now let's talk about this woman. We don't know who she was married or whether or not she was married before the bleeding started. We don't know if she had any children. The only thing we know about her is that she's had this problem for 12 years. So in the eyes of her community, she's unclean. Under the law, she cannot come into contact with any other person, nor can any person touch the clothes she wore, a chair she sat on, or the bed she slept in. She is supposed to be completely isolated from society, including her family, if there was one. And yet, in an act of civil disobedience, which is what was taking place here, she is present in this crowd. Now, the text doesn't tell us, but I wonder how the crowd reacted. I wonder how many people are yelling, unclean, or lawbreaker, as this woman is working her way through the crowd, trying to dehumanize her as she's trying to get to Jesus. But the woman was not about to let the crowd get in the way of her restoration so that she could live freely once again. She touches Jesus' clothes and immediately, because it's Mark, felt in her body that she was healed. Now, everything would have been fine, except for Jesus felt it too. Jesus felt power leave him. So Jesus stops, looks around, and says, who touched my clothes? And his disciples are like, are you kidding me? 
You got all these people swarming all around you, and you're wondering who touched your clothes? But the woman came forward and told Jesus everything. So what's Jairus thinking now? What's Jairus wondering? I'm a leader of the synagogue and my daughter is dying and you were stopping to talk to this outcast? Yeah, she's sick and she's been sick a long time, but she's not dying. My daughter is dying. What is Jesus saying by giving this marginalized woman priority over the synagogue leader's daughter? What would we be thinking if we were Jairus? So Jesus is wrapping up this conversation with the woman. There is no admonishment for her being in the crowd or for touching him, no concern that she made him unclean, and no instruction to go and self to the show herself to the priest to prove she's been healed. Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And Jesus said it loud enough to make sure the crowd heard so that they knew this woman was no longer unclean. And while all this is going on, the people come from the leader's house. I don't know if you caught it in the text, but did you notice how Jairus went from being Jairus to being the leader? Mark removed Jairus' name from him at this point in the text. Your daughter's dead, no point in troubling Jesus. Now the author doesn't tell us how Jairus reacted, only that Jesus heard what they said and looked at him and said, stop being afraid. Some of our translations translate it, don't be afraid. But others say, no, no, no. It's stop being afraid. Only believe. They get to the house and the people are weeping. weeping. Jesus says, she's just sleeping. So Jesus takes mom and dad and the big three, Pete, Jim, and Jack, as Pastor Lou Humberger used to refer to them, takes them up to the little girl's room. And Jesus does it. Again. See, the law says any person that touches a dead body is unclean. But Jesus reaches down and takes the little girl's hand. The little girl rises. She is not dead. And Jesus once again overcomes the law. So in chapter 5, Jesus went to the land of the Gentiles, healed a Gentile man plagued by evil spirits. Then he came back and healed and restored a marginalized woman who was an outcast from her family and community. And then Jesus healed the daughter of the synagogue leader. Jesus is providing an example for us. Jesus is making clear that his healing authority crosses all boundaries, including ethnic and gender boundaries. Jesus chooses not to leave people in the conditions he finds them. And I wonder, can the Christian community alter the conditions of people's lives? Can we bring healing in troubled circumstances? Do we not also have to cross boundaries, physical and otherwise, and advocate for life-giving meaning and change? But what does it mean for us to cross boundaries and bring healing in troubled circumstances? You know, if we follow the example of Jesus, we must care for these children. But if we follow the example of Jesus, we must also care for these children. Last week, Debbie and I heard a pediatrician speak on the trauma that these children have suffered. Her words echoed the words of Charles Nelson, a pediatric professor at Harvard Medical School. The effect is catastrophic he said, and in a petition, nearly 7,700 mental health professionals and over 100 organizations said that to pretend that separated children do not grow up with the shrapnel of this traumatic experience embedded in their minds is to disregard everything we know about child development, the brain, and trauma. The harm will take a lifetime to undo. 
If we follow the example of Jesus, who is not concerned about boundaries or ethnicity or gender, these are our children. So what are we going to do to bring healing to them? Are we willing to work to alter the conditions of their lives? Are we willing to advocate for their healing? What impact do we want to have on our children? Amen.